All right. Thank you, Barrett. Uh, my name is Zach Downey, and I will be hosting uh, this afternoon's industry panel. I'm really excited for the final panel today. Uh, there's a great variety of different backgrounds uh, in industry on our panel today. Um, and so I kind of want to just jump right in. Um, I'd like to take a few seconds, um, if each of our lovely panelists can introduce themselves, uh, maybe just in 10, 15 seconds, and tell us uh, where you work and just a brief bit about your background. Um, we can start off with Leah. Hi, I'm Leah. Um, I'm also actually here with my cat, Millie. Um, and we are in California near Silicon Valley. I work at Google, um, specifically for Google Cloud, and I work in developer relations, which means that I'm a software engineer, but instead of building products that end users use, I build products that other software engineers use to build those products. So I like to tell my mom, it's like I write recipes for other cooks to do stuff, only those cooks are other software engineers. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Anam, are you there? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi, how is everybody? Um, so my name is Anam. I currently work at Novartis Pharmaceutical Company and I am a cell processing lead. So we treat patients who suffer from B cell lymphoma from children to adults. And it's a 10 day process and we culture T cells um, and then we infuse it back into the patient. And currently I'm doing my master's also uh, MBA at Montclair State University. So pretty much a scientist, but kind of working in the modules right now. Cool, thank you. Uh, Susanna. Hi, my name is Susanna and I am in the Indianapolis area in Indiana. And I work for Corteva AgriSciences uh, in their discovery department. And essentially what I do is I synthesize molecules that potentially have the, um, the ability to become either a fungicide or a herbicide um, or other um, functionalities in uh, agrosciences. Great, thank you so much. All right, Ornella. Hi everyone. So I am Ornella and I work at a pharmaceutical company called Abvi and Mostly what I do, I work with proteins. I'm a, like a biochemist. Uh, I attach small molecules onto proteins for other scientists to study, whether they're going to look at um, therapeutics for different diseases that we work on or can help uh, build assays to study other things. So I am in Massachusetts, um, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Valerie. All right, hello everyone today. Um, so I am a research materials engineer at NASA Langley Research Center. Um, and so if anyone's seen Hidden Figures, that would be the center um, that I'm located at in Southeast Virginia and Hampton. Um, so at Langley, there's a lot of different research we're doing right now. And as a materials engineer, I'm really lucky that I get to kind of touch a different, a variety of different projects. Um, so I work with ceramic materials um, that we can apply for um, high temperature applications such as reentry or hypersonic flight. And I also work on ceramics, another class of ceramics, looking at wear resistant materials that we can actually implement as coatings on the lunar surface. Um, so uh, looking at different material systems that will enable a sustained human presence on the moon is the other big area I'm working in right now. Sure. And so I look forward to talking to you guys today. Yeah, thank you all so much. I mean, I. I don't even have to say that we have a star-studded panel. It's amazing the variety of different backgrounds and awesome things you all are doing. So jumping right into the questions, we already have Q&A questions coming in. Uh, so we're gonna jump right into those. Uh, first is how do you think your work is making an impact both now and for the future? Um, let's start with Susanna. Well, my work definitely makes an impact because everybody has to eat. And um, as it stands right now, that is one of the problems that we have in society where there sometimes isn't enough food for everyone. And working in agrochemistry um, in the agrosciences field definitely makes you aware of those problems and of the impact that you can potentially have on um, the future of the food industry. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, how about Leah? Do you have any thoughts? 
Yeah, so um, in Google Cloud, sometimes it's harder to see the obvious impact, like having people needing to eat. Um, but the thing about at Google Cloud, we're building tools that are used by people in other industries. So it might be in like agrotech or it might be in aerospace engineering. And if people can't figure out how to use those tools, they're just not going to use them and there's not going to be any forward progress. So I, I like to think that uh, my life gets to be hard at work so other people's lives are easier. Great, that makes a lot, yeah, it's very important to build tools for other people, make their lives easier, absolutely. Um, Valerie, how about you? Yeah, so as a researcher, a lot of times uh, we see some of the technologies we work on, they tend to be more long-term, so 10, 20, even 30 years out, we'll start working on ideas now that can then ultimately be implemented. Um, one thing really exciting right now is that um, with our current charge, our agency charge to get boots on the ground by 2024 on the moon surface, um, there's a lot of potential for the technologies that I'm doing, that I'm working on right now in lab, to actually make it on a mission. Um, which is very exciting because like I mentioned, usually a lot of the work I've done has um, longer term applications. Um, but right now, so it's really exciting time in our agency to um, be contributing to something that will hopefully come into fruition here in the next four or so years. Got it, great. Uh, Ornella, any thoughts? So, uh, so a lot of my work right now is also kind of upstream, so may not even see it for 10 years, like in Valerie's case. Um, but I do stuff that can, that enable other scientists to find cures or therapies for diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's disease. So I think that I, I, I'm happy for the small part that I get to play in that for my company. Well, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. That's great. Uh, I know. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, so for Novartis, currently, uh, this one of the leading companies in gene therapy. So it's very important that we work with getting as many patients as possible because we recently just went, well, actually, about one to two years, we went commercial. Um, so it's really important for us to get um, people who really need this therapy. Um, and that's what we're working on right now because this is the last, last option for them. Yeah, no. It, it helps in helping them out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, all very important, very important. Um, so we're going to jump into a question that um, anyone is welcome to answer. You can kind of perk up or raise your hand uh, if you have something to say. Um, how did you realize that this is the career you wanted to be in? Well, um, I'll go first. Um, I have a very non-traditional background. I originally was a theater major. And I did go to college for two years in musical theater. And it wasn't until I decided to switch my major to pre-med that I started getting more involved in the sciences. And when I had to take organic chemistry, that's when I discovered that I really had a passion for chemistry and I wanted to pursue research. And that's what really ultimately led me to changing my major completely and pursuing a degree in chemistry, later on organic chemistry. Anybody else? Um, so when I was seven years old, I wanted to be a doctor. And up till even after college, I did everything for pre-med. And then suddenly I had a moment of realization. I'm like, well, I don't want to be a doctor. <laughs> and that's when, um, and I applied for jobs and I got my first job after college in Novartis. And that's when I started working on gene therapy. And I'm like, I get to use all my science skills and I still get to help out. I'm just not a doctor, but it was nice to, you know, you could change your plans at any time, so. Yeah, we, it's something we noticed in, in past panels of viewers of seeing the other panels today that there's a lot of careers and, and paths out there that you don't even know exist today. And there's a lot of opportunities and you might get a set of skills and you might realize there's a bunch of different places you can apply those skills. So I, Valerie, did you have something to, to add? Yeah, kind of exactly in line with what you were mentioning. So I admittedly have always wanted to work for NASA. Disclaimer though, there's a lot of people I work with who didn't have that, in, that plan in their life and ended up at the agency as well. Um, but I actually initially thought I was going to become an astronomer. Um, I was very, very dedicated to astronomy and um, pursued it even in undergrad um, 
the catch was uh, the advice I would say probably we've heard throughout the day is try and try any and everything you can, especially in, in undergrad. Um, because interestingly for me, after my freshman year, um, I was able to participate in a materials science and engineering research opportunity um, at Purdue University. And um, that really opened my eyes to a field I'd never considered or really even knew about. Um, and so um, thankfully, um, I had a lot of great opportunities as well to do research actually at Cornell as well when I was an undergrad in materials. And so I was able to kind of sample different fields that helped me determine this was, you know, materials was a path I wanted to take. So my biggest advice is to just try everything. And I think ultimately you'll be able to find something that is, is interesting to you and help you get to where you want to be. Absolutely. Great thoughts. Um, anybody else want to add into that or move on to the next question? Okay, cool. Uh, so I will continue on the NASA topic for one second, uh, Valerie. All right. uh, we have a specific question for you. Um, how did, uh, this is from Jacqueline. Um, how did you get into NASA, which you kind of discussed a little bit about, um, but uh, what would you give, uh, this person says, I would like to work there when I am older. Like you said, a lot of people feel that way. I bet she's not the only one. Um, I have seen hidden figures and have been inspired uh, to, to work on the ground with mission control. What advice would you give to someone like Jacqueline who's trying to get involved? Um, that's a really great question. Everyone's path, of course, is different. Um, I would say my biggest advice is just work hard at um, whatever your interest is. If, that's, if you want to end up in ground control, awesome. Um, try to take as many opportunities as you can to get real world experience in that area. Um, NASA, as, as in case some of you um, don't know, does have internship opportunities um, for students ranging all the way from high school through the graduate level as well as for even um, community teachers as well. And so I think NASA internships are a really great opportunity to kind of get a feel what working for NASA would be like without, you know, necessarily working for NASA. Um, and so uh, for me, um, I was able to get a position um, through what's called the Pathways Program. Um, and that's specifically for students um, starting at the undergraduate, the graduate level. Um, and so if you guys have heard of a co-op opportunity, it's kind of similar in that um, you have the chance to work at NASA for you know, a summer or a semester, and then go back to your university and kind of rotate, if you will, it's like a rotational program. Um, so I, I was able to get um, my foot in the door, if you will, with that program. And ultimately I was able to convert to a full-time NASA employee. So um, I, I, I highly encourage any internship, whether it's at NASA, in academia, or even in industry, because it'll give you a really good idea of what to expect if you want to go in to work for that place down the road. So. Yep. Yeah, great insight. Thank you so much. Let's see. So this is another question for the group, whoever wants to jump in. Um, what would you do, or uh, would you recommend to someone if they knew they wanted to get involved in STEM in some way, but they didn't know exactly what the path was for them, what exactly they interest, they didn't have a, a you know, go-to passion, but they knew they wanted to get involved. Yes. Go oh, for it. This is me. This is me <laughs> still. Um, I would say try all of the things. Every time you have an opportunity to try something, even if you're not sure you're gonna like it, you should try it because it's really important to figure out what you don't like as well as what you do like. Um, and that's really important when you are like trying to decide on what you're gonna study in school and also what you wanna work on. Cause you could think, oh, I really wanna work in this one field, but then you might try it and be like, ooh, this isn't for me. Like I thought I was gonna be a math major in college and after two math classes, we really weren't getting along, me and math. But then I tried <laughs> computer science and I was like, oh no, this is what I was looking for. This is awesome. So Great. try everything. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Ornella, something to add? Yeah, so I, I totally agree with Leah um, because, and I, what I wanted to add is that don't get the mindset that you don't like something. So for me, when I was an undergrad, I had this idea that chemistry was the most superior science and I didn't like biology and I had no basis for that, that um, decision apart from like, I thought biology was like memorizing. But then in grad school, as I was pursuing my PhD, I realized like I loved the bio and the chemistry that coming together. So be open-minded and as Leah said, try as much as you can. Yeah, I should say that I do use math a lot and it's not that I don't like math, it's that I didn't want math to be the primary focus of my life. So good catch, Ornella. Thank <laughs> you for calling that out. 
Anyone else have anything to add on that? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I totally agree with um, Leia too. Um, it's what you don't like, you need to try. Like, same with me when I was in college, I loved biology, but I didn't like chemistry. But at the same time, I'm more of a hands-on person. So my second year of college, I started doing research and that's what got me into STEM. I was like, oh, I really like working in the lab. I like the visuals. I don't want to read a textbook all the time. So if you can go into something more hands-on and try to work through it and see if it works for you. Great, that's great insight, thank you. All right, next question. Um, so a common topic that people in industry talk about a lot is work-life balance. And one of the things that some of our uh, attendees asking in want to know is how do you juggle those things? How do you juggle work-life balance? How do you find time for your mental health and uh, for fun? Um, I'll start. Um, so I absolutely love my job because it allows me to have a life. And after going through college, undergrad, getting a master's and then pursuing a PhD, you tend to forget about the normal things in life, like meeting people and socializing and having a family. And one of the most amazing things that has happened to me is that I now have a six month old daughter um, and it's something that I really, really wanted, but had to put off while I was in school. And I feel that being in industry allows for that work-life balance. And, you know, they, they care about you. They care about your mental health. They encourage you to take time off. They encourage you to do things that involve socializing. Um, and even now with what we're going through with the pandemic, they actually encourage us to work from home and write proposals and do things that will allow us to take care of our families as well as our own personal health. That's great. Does anybody have anything to add on that? I, oh, go for it, Valerie. Oh, okay, I was gonna chime in with the, with the government um, perspective. Um, we do have the benefit of having a lot of tools that um, I'm sure a lot of folks in industry have been using as well. Telecommuting from home has been a pretty common activity um, in industry and government for a while. And so I'd say that that has been a really helpful tool, especially nowadays um, in the work from home situation we're in. Um, and going back to the work-life balance, um, I wanted to kind of reframe it in a different way. I had a mentor um, who posed it rather than being a balance, um, but having it as more of an integration. So work-life integration. And that meaning more that, you know, sometimes, you know, some of the days work might have a little more going on, so you're gonna have you're gonna have to maybe check your email at night or something like that, um, or you might be going through a, a situation where you, you have a child, you you have you grow your family, um, and you'll need to be able to pivot to that a little bit more. Um, and so I think knowing um, that a balance it it varies for everyone, and so one person's balance doesn't look the exact same as another. Um, I have a I have a two year old. She's taking a nap right now, which is why my house is so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, just keeping in mind that uh, sometimes you have to do what works best for you and your family. Um, and if that looks different than, you know, what someone else might be doing, then that's totally okay. Um, so just want to chime in with that. Great. Thank you so much. Now, Leah, did you have something to add? I wanted to echo what Valerie said about how it looks different for everyone. And it can sometimes be hard when you're in industry. It's really tempting to compare yourself to your peers and be like, oh my gosh, they're working so much later than I am. But that person's, the other person's work-life balance is different than yours. And you don't want to be trying to keep up with them at the expense of your mental health and running the, rest, running the risk of burning out. Great point. Great point. All right, uh, moving on. So what is a common misconception um, that you think people have about your, either your career or your specific job or your company that you like to mention or something you didn't know going into your job? So I'll start again. <laughs> um, Usually when you're pursuing a, a degree in chemistry, you hear a lot about the academic side and you'll hear also a lot about the pharmaceutical industry side. Um, but one thing that I didn't know much about was the agrosciences side of chemistry. Um, and after interviewing with the company and accepting their offer, um, I started to realize that 
there's so much more behind agrosciences than just making a pesticide or making a herbicide. Um, being in discovery, we actually get to see the compounds that we make get tested in the greenhouse. And these are little things that, you know, you don't hear much about because agrosciences industry is not one that's prevalent when you're in chemistry. You learn about the drugs and the pharmaceuticals, but you really don't hear much about the agrosciences industry. So I guess one of the biggest misconceptions is that if you go into agrosciences, all you're going to do is make pesticides. Um, and in actuality, it's more than that. There's the discovery side, there's the process side, and there's also the business side of it that you can be a part of when you're part of that type of industry. Great. Good insight. Thank you. Anybody else want to add on that? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Leah, you um, can go ahead. I was going to say, like, there, there's a lot of misconceptions or stereotypes about people in computer science that's like a bunch of nerdy, primarily dudes, and that's all that people do all day, like, at work and outside of work, and I, I don't even remember who said this to me, but someone, I think when I was in college, like, emphasized that you could do things that weren't computer science as your hobby, and I do have colleagues who like to program in their spare time, and they think that's fun. I don't. Um, I do it all day at work. I, I want to do something different when I get home and that's totally okay. And I have other colleagues, like one of the people I sit next to, um, he does stand up comedy in the evenings. Like that's his outside of work hobby. And I have another friend who like is in a super competitive soccer league. Uh, I like to crochet and I have my cat. I play Animal Crossing, uh, all kinds of things that aren't computer science when I'm not working. Awesome. No? Oh, I wanted to add um, one of the misconceptions people have is like when you go to a pharma company, you're just going to make pills. And people don't understand, like, because it's a new concept, gene therapy is like literally like, you take the patient's blood, you culture it for 10 days, and you infuse it back into the patient. And it's like the body's healing itself. So this is like a misconception. Oh, you make pills? Oh, you just give them medication. So one of the things is that one of the aspects of gene therapy is like it's revolutionary. It's really new. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, super cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on. Next question. How would you recommend getting involved in STEM uh, with a mindset on income stability? Are there resources and things out there that people can use to try to get involved with that in mind? When you say uh, income, uh, can you, well, repeat, yeah, repeat the question, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so how would you recommend someone um, with a mindset on income stability, um, with, with uh, concerns in income uh, potentially getting in the way of getting involved in STEM? How would you recommend getting past those barriers? Uh, I, I guess I can only speak from my perspective. Uh, so I, so my interest in STEM, specifically chemistry, started when I was in high school in Trinidad and Tobago, which is a, a small Caribbean island. Um, and I think one of the things that we did as a family was to, basically my mom and my, my dad encouraged me, even though they didn't know anything about science, they encouraged me to excel. And I sought out a lot of scholarship opportunities so that I could, you know, immigrate to the US. And while I was here, I worked um, and I, I tried my best. I, I followed my passion and found financial aid as the means for completing my undergrad. And one of the things about going, pursuing your PhD immediately from undergrad to uh, the, ne for the, as the next step is uh, in STEM, your PhD is usually uh, quote unquote paid for in the sense that the school funds your research and you may teach for them for a, a, a semester or two, or you may find fellowships. Uh, so that's what I did. I, when I, I got into Cornell for my PhD program, I you know, taught Gen Chem lab class for, for a year. And then I got a, a fellowship from the, from the NIH. And so I, I sought out opportunities in that way. Um, and one of the things you can do, so this is one of the, the best advice I've ever got in my life was the, the basically my undergrad 
professor said, the only way for sure that you will get a no is if you don't apply. And so she told me, you apply for everything and anything once it, it, you're interested or you think it will work out well. So I applied. <laughs> I guess that's one of my, that's what I would recommend. Um, and then as you get your career and so on, you, you look for better and more opportunities in that way. I want to say something about um, summer jobs. I know like some internships in STEM are paid and sometimes they're not. And if you're in a situation where you need to work in a non STEM related job over the summer or over school break, like to make money to pay for school, that's okay. Cause you're still learning skills that are going to transfer to a job in STEM. I'm going to guess that everyone else on the panel, you have to work with other people at your job and learning how to work with other people is a skill that you can develop like in any after school or summer job that you have. I use skills that I developed as a babysitter to handle other people because it turns out that like learning how to deal with little kids who don't want to behave translates really well to difficult adults too. And I'll try to, um, to add to, in addition to summer opportunities that are paid, um, I did a work study program throughout undergrad um, to help um, maintain financial stability, if you will. And so I was actually a classroom assistant um, in local elementary through middle school um, it, schools in the area. And so there are different ways. Obviously, everyone's situation is different. Um, and sometimes you just have to find a job. <laughs> Um, whether it's in STEM or not, you got to do what you got to do to pay the bills. And um, like Leah was pointing out, the skills you develop on those other jobs, that you'll probably learn things that you'll be able to translate into what you're doing for your career later on too in STEM. Great point. Great point. Susanna, did you have something to add? Um, I was just going to kind of echo on the same sentiment that everybody else was saying, you know, you, in, a, in a word, you have to hustle. If it's something that you really want, you have to get out there and you have to reach for it. And I guess like in my personal experience, I went to a private undergraduate school that was very small. So it didn't have the name and the recognition. Um, and they did have programs that actually paid for um, school while you were attending undergrad. And for my own personal um, story, I actually applied to one of these programs and I was denied because I held outside jobs. And I was actually told by the person leading this program that um, the fact that I had so many outside jobs uh, did not make me PhD material. Um, and I feel that in life, you're going to encounter a lot of people that are going to tell you that you can't do something, whether it's applying to a program or applying to an internship. Um, and that may discourage people that are, you know, financially financially in, unstable in a way. Um, and you just have to hustle. Like I went, I got online, I started looking for other programs um, across the US that had internships and that had summer research um, opportunities. And I was able to actually get accepted into one of those programs at another university and I went and it was an eye-opening experience because they did provide a small stipend and they allowed me to do research at a huge research lab. Um, and I just feel that if I would have let one small thing like that get in the way of me not pursuing my dream in a way, um, it would have been a huge mistake. So yes, seek out opportunities, but if those opportunities are not given to you or you, you can't get those opportunities, find another one. Don't let that stop you from achieving the dream that you want in the end. Yeah. Also, when it comes to finding opportunities, one thing that can be kind of hard without practice um, is using your network and like ask if you know someone or someone knows someone, your brother's cousin's uncle works in the field that you want. It's not cheating if you talk to them. Like you can just ask them questions. You're not asking them to give you a job, but even just getting more information and using the people that you know will help. Great insight. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of that. Uh, one more thing, we would like to talk a little bit about uh, your personal success. And so you guys have all had fantastic paths to get where you are today, but can you hone in on a specific personal success story 
or a particularly rewarding experience you have experienced sometime in your STEM career? Um, I'll start. Um, so like I had mentioned before, I, I went through the entire process of going to a small undergraduate school and due to the fact that I was at a small undergraduate school, it became a little bit more difficult for me to get into one of the big name chemistry institutions. Um, and so I went to Florida State, which is not a bad school. It's actually in the top 50. Um, and I did my master's there. And then I ended up going to the University of South Florida, which is in Tampa, Florida. And it's a, it's a large school, but it's not well recognized in the field of chemistry. And for me, it was a huge accomplishment when I obtained my degree in organic chemistry and I was able to get a postdoc at Northwestern University, which is ranked in the top five chemistry institutions in the US. So I feel that even if you start small, as long as you work hard, you will achieve a goal that you have. And for me, one of the goals was that I wanted to postdoc at a very well you know, recognized institution and I was able to achieve that. And that was one of the best feelings that I've ever had. Um, so it, if, if that story, you know, rings true to anyone, it's just, you know, work hard and don't give up. Always keep going because it doesn't matter where you start, you will get to where you want to be in the end. Yeah, thank you. It's incredibly motivational. Anybody else have anything to add? Yeah, um, so one of the stories I have is when I was a freshman, I came in and I was very eager to do research. And I got told by my professor that, you know, uh, you're just a freshman, you can't do research yet, you have to still study um, X, Y, and Z, right? So what I did was I had my brother, he went to Stephen Institute and I went to MSU in Jersey. And he had a professor that was looking for someone to do research. So that was, um, I applied to it and I got into it for a summer research program. And that was my first ever research and I learned how to do cell culture. And that was like the beginning of everything because after that I got into virology, I got stipend for that. I even won like a presentation at MACUB. Um, and that's how everything just got started. So I was really happy that I took that chance and I applied for it and I got it. So you know, always keep trying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we've got a little under 10 minutes left. Um, so I want to wrap up with a couple questions. We could probably go on all day with the amount of questions we've been getting from the Q&A. So I appreciate that. I appreciate your time. Um, if you could go back to yourself uh, in middle school, go back in time and talk to yourself in middle school or, you know, early high school and tell yourself one bit of advice, you know, sum up everything you learned in your career, what do you think it would be? Um, so for me, the advice would be to not be close minded in what science is um, and what it can be. Uh, as I told you, to me, chemistry was everything. And that was very important because of my like high school teacher who saw that I was good in chemistry and like encouraged me. But science is very broad and STEM is very broad and we're learning new things every day that expands that knowledge. So I think I would tell the little, you know, 19 year old girl, continue having that passion, but find and be open to new and more experiences with, with that same passion. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Ornella. Anybody else? Uh, some of the advice I gave earlier was kind of me giving it to my former self about it's not cheating to use your network and to ask those questions and to focus on being your best self and not comparing yourselves to other people because everyone's experience is different. I think I would have told myself that no one in life is going to know me better than I know myself. And regardless of what other people say, whether they tell me that I'm not smart enough to be an organic chemist or that I don't have the resources to accomplish a goal that I have, um, if I know that I can do it, I will achieve it. And that's the one thing that I think I would 
go back and tell myself that no matter what, nobody knows me as well as I know myself. And if I put my mind to it, I can achieve anything. Yeah, I'll chime in echoing exactly what Susanna was saying, that at the end of the day, you do you. There's a lot of people that, you know, might try to bring you down or look at you funny if you're, for example, me, my sixth grade self, the only girl in computer camp. <laughs> True story. Um, you know, take advantage of opportunities. If there's something that interests you and, you know, you go there and no one looks like you, that's okay. You know, just give it time and um, work hard and be true to yourself and you'll find your way. Valerie, I was also the girl at science, the only girl at science camp one year. And you know what? It was great. I had a great time. I think we've all had that where we're the one girl. I was the one girl <laughs> at chemistry lab. Um, which was all guys, and you know what? I turned out fine. <laughs> all right, uh, so we, we should wrap it up with one fun question just to end it. What is your favorite food? Let's go around, around the horn. Mm. Gotta pick one. Strawberries. Good answer. Tacos. Great answer. Anybody else? I love lasagna. Oh my, I was about to say. <laughs> lasagna, lasagna is winning. <laughs> it's funny you bring this up. I was having this conversation with my husband the other day. To me, it's so hard to pin down what my exact favorite food is. But I think right now I would say cheese. Any cheese. <laughs> Anything with cheese. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you all extremely much. Uh, this was a fantastic panel. I really enjoyed it. And, and based on the, the Q&A we were getting in the entire time, everyone's really enjoyed it very much. So thank you all very much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you. Thanks for having us. And thanks for your questions, everyone watching. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Yeah, and I was going to just say really quick, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, I mm -hmm. believe that you guys have our contact information. And, if you guys have any questions about grad school or going into industry or just anything like that, you know, feel free to reach out. Yes, absolutely, I agree. Great, we appreciate it so much, thank you. All right, back to you, Barrett. Thanks, Thanks so much, and yeah, just to reiterate, you know, um, if, you, if you do wanna reach out, you can always um, find us, just reach out through EYH and we can put you in touch with uh, any of the panelists that you've seen today or any of the other, other presenters as well, so.